Thank you everyone for joining us for this webinar, Right Sizing Esports Technical Solutions from Schools to Stadia, presented by Cameron O'Neill. My name is Laura Lawrence and I'm the Global Marketing Director at Harman. So just a few things before we get started. Everyone on the call is muted to keep down noise levels during the webinar. However, there is a Q&A function where you can submit questions and Cameron will answer them at the end of today's presentation. This webinar is also being recorded and the link will be made available a few days after the presentation. We do have a number of other webinars taking place over the next few months for audio, lighting, video, and control, and we'd like to encourage you to take a look at the different webinars in our Learning Sessions Workshop Series on pro.harman.com. We're adding new sessions daily, and we have over 25 sessions scheduled for July and August, so watch for those coming up on the calendar. And now I'd like to introduce you to my colleague, Cameron O'Neill, the presenter for today's webinar. Cameron is a 20-year veteran of the event industry, having worked at the Sydney Opera House and for Rydell throughout Asia. At Harman, he has helped esports companies throughout China build AV systems for major events, installed facilities, and a major company's network studio system. And now I'll pass it over to you, Cameron. Hey, thank you, Laura, and good morning, evening, or afternoon, everyone. I see that there's people joining from everywhere, so that's great to see. Uh, so yes, my name is Cameron. Uh, I will uh, also mention something that's not in the bio. I am unapolo unapologetically Australian, so it's very uh, likely that I might speed up. If that's the case, just send me a message to say, slow down, you're speaking too fast. Um, I will answer questions at the end, or if they do pop up halfway through and I see them, I'll give them a shot. Uh, yeah, so today uh, I'm going to be looking at getting the right size esports system uh, for the event that you're looking at. Uh, and as Laura mentioned in the intro, uh, I've been working with esports companies for a few years now. And uh, I shall also mention uh, that I have two children who are running around in the background. So apologies if like this, they come and say goodbye. Hey. Talk on, can you hop out please? Okay. Right. Okay. <laughs> so um, esports. Big event, uh, big event industry now. It's uh, it's getting bigger. It's still growing even with the uh, the current state of the world, uh, and that's because esports is always built up around um, the individual sitting in front of a computer. So there's like built-in social distancing. It's not like uh, say a football match where you're running into each other and and, and tackling. So that's always been great. Uh, that being said, it's been often held in small events, uh, event spaces, which can get uh, pretty tight. So what I wanted to look at today uh, was basically looking at the, the basics of esports, what makes an esport, what is at the low end, what's at the top end, and what's kind of generic across everything. Uh, and then also a, a quick look at the, the business fundamentals. In that, I mean, looking at where the money's coming from, uh, which I always find a little bit surprising when I look at esports, because it's a very diverse uh, set of revenues compared to a, a generic sport. Then I want to look basically at the anatomy of an esports event. And I think this is probably the key thing for me when we talk about getting the right event, uh, getting the right equipment for the right size event, because there are some fundamentals that you need everywhere, but then of course you can change them and scale them up. So that's going to be the, the bare bones uh, that we're going to look at. And then we're going to look through the AVL systems, the audio, the lighting and the video systems, just to kind of get at least a grasp about what's absolutely necessary and then what's the, the special source on top that makes that event really pop. Uh, and then right at the end, what I've done um, is just put together what I call happy meals. Um, you know, the, this is something that kind of looks at what's available on the market and what you'd probably go into if you wanted to put it on an event of these size. And all these are based on real examples. Um, a lot of the companies we've worked with or I've worked with uh, have got pretty tight NDAs about what they do. So we can't really mention names, but if you look at the pictures, um, you'll probably find some cues there. So, yeah, this is uh, what we're going to run into, and um, off we go. So, of course, you know, we, I have to do the, the official thing. You know, when we talk about Harman, uh, a lot of people know the individual brands but don't know us as the umbrella company. But uh, as you can see, we have, we have pretty, much, pretty much everything from one end of the scale to the other. So we have, you know, our, our microphones, uh, headphones. We have processors. We have mixing consoles. We have lighting, amplifiers, and speakers. Uh, but at the same time, there's a lot of things that we don't have. And so what I'll be doing through this session is also showing you the things that we don't have, the, the glue bits um, that would, you'd also be uh, required to have to actually run one of these events. So whilst we do have a lot of things, I'm not going to stand here and tell you that you can buy everything. From, you know, we're not a one-stop esports shop. Okay, so let's look at the basics. What are the basic esports? You know, what defines an esports rather than someone sitting at home and playing? And 
really, I think that the, the key thing here is that we're talking about a competitive video game. We're not talking about uh, solitaire uh, or something that you just play by yourself or maybe online with friends with a, just for the fun of it. We're actually tar- talking about a, a full-on competition here. And these are usually organized into leagues. Uh, there are a number of leagues. Some are run by the game publishers themselves, like a Konami or a Nintendo, uh, or, or Blizzard is probably the most, uh, most recognizable. Others are just organized independently and then will have their own uh, events and their own competitions that are based around that as well. So it can be, it can be either from the publisher side or it can be independently organized. And, that's in, and both, of, but both of them are competitive. The other thing is that these days you'll find that they're actually run on pretty much any device. Now, as, a, as an AV guy, of course, I love to have the PC because a PC has usually got every output I could want. I can mirror out um, HDMI. I can get, you know, if I really was <laughs> going backwards in time, I could use RGB. Connecting a computer to a video system is something that we've all been doing for, for decades. Uh, a console is closer, but you find, you find that you've got less control over the settings that you can have. And then finally mobile, um, which is relatively new. Um, and because it's relatively new, people don't have the experience with it. The technologies exist, uh, but of course they're still expensive and, and people would prefer to use PC. That being said, I think the majority of new players, I think it's something in the order of 60% of new players are coming in playing exclusively mobile. So as we move forward as an industry, we have to prepare ourselves as the video guys basically uh, to get that video and the audio off the mobile and then into the, the audience's eyes. Um, in most of the world, the athletes are actually professionals. So the only thing they do is esports, and I'll show you some examples of these guys in the future. And there is a lot of diversion around esports and saying, "Oh, you know, they're just people playing games." Um, and why would anyone want to pay to watch somebody else play games? And I had a conversation about this not too long ago. And in reality, you could say that about pretty much any sport. Uh, if you think about soccer, you know, soccer is a world game. There's billions of people watching. All you need to do to play esports is you get your soccer ball and kick it around uh, out the back. And t- in some way or form, you're playing soccer. Uh, but why do you watch a soccer game then? Well, because you want to see the best in the world play. You want to see how they play. You want to say, oh, that guy can, you know, if, for example, Beckham. Beckham can bend the ball if he kicks the ball that way. And I want to do that too. And so you skill yourself up by watching the best in, in, that, uh, in that event. And it's exactly the same with esports. People watch streams day on uh, day in, day out about their favorite game to watch the tips about how to get better. Uh, they'll read blog posts about what's the best keyboard, what's the best mouse, what's the best equipment. Um, and because of that, there's an, an industry that's now built up around these players so they can become professionals. And I think you can, you can look across any platform, any social media platform these days, and you'll find examples of people who have come to the top of that platform, even for doing the most... Um, let's say simple, simplistic looking content, but because they're making the content and getting in front of millions of people, they can actually start to make uh, a serious amount of money. And with esports, the prize money is now in the millions of dollars. Uh, I think the highest so far is the League of Legends world final. I can't remember if it's 2018 or 2019, uh, but the prize money was in the order of like $13 million. Uh, And then I believe Fortnite was also pretty close there as well last year. There are four main groups of sports, of, of games, I say, that, uh, that, that give you sort of an increasing complexity in the, uh, the kind of event that you have to put on. The first one is what a lot of people think when they see esports, especially now, uh, because you have a lot of promotion around, say, the Formula One doing their esports tournament in parallel to their, their, um, their normal races. Uh, a lot of companies have had to go, and a lot of sports codes have had to go to esports um, to get around lockdown laws. And the sports simulator, uh, I'll show you in a, in a second. Um, a first-person shooter, though, is, uh, is where you're looking through someone's eyes. You're not controlling a team anymore. You're not looking at something that's based in reality. Uh, you're basically running around shooting up people. It is the most popular kind of game in terms of what's being played online. But in esports, it's, it's still up there because it's exciting to watch. Uh, but it is very difficult to watch. The one that's really the, the money winner, though, is the real-time strategy, the RTS game, or what's also called top-down, and I'll show you an example of that in a second as well. This is where multiple players are not controlling one person anymore. They're now controlling a team again, but you're looking from a, a top-down angle, um, but the map is, is uh, not visible to everyone. 
And then the last one is your, your Battle Royale, which is kind of like a first-person shooter, but where you've got hundreds of players um, playing and you basically win. You start with 100 people and whoever's standing at the end uh, becomes your winner of that round. And so the, the popular games you hear about now, like uh, Fortnite and PUBG, uh, fall into that uh, Battle Royale category. Um, there is one more, Apex Legends as well. So if we look at a sports simulator here, this is a soccer sports simulator. It looks you know, very much like a real sports game. So everyone can see everything. You can even see on the bottom here, you can see where the other team is, even if they're not visible on screen, you're usually based around real players. I also group in games like you know, Tekken and Street Fighter into here as well, because on a technical side, the players can see everything that's happening. Now, there might be individual things on a screen that you wouldn't want the other player to see. For example, in a baseball game, you wouldn't want to see the pitch, but everything is effectively visible. So you can take any stream, put it out to the audience, and they'll be happy. Uh, there is no reason to keep things secret. You can have people really close to each other, and you can have big screens. So this is a really easy event to put on. Um, but because they're usually balanced between uh, what's happening in real life, like a, a real soccer fan might want to play this game, um, it doesn't seem to have as much gameplay fun because you can't have all gameplay um, experience and no realism because then the realistic people won't want it and vice versa. If it was completely realistic. No one would actually want to play the game because let's face it, none of us are pro level football players, soccer players, baseball players. So the next step up is something like this. And this is a screenshot from, um, well, I think it's actually a, a, a made up image from Overwatch. So Overwatch is one of the most popular first person games. You also have games like Counter-Strike, uh, also known as CS or CSGO. Uh, these events you can see here, you're looking through a person's view at the screen. Now that means that you won't be able to see the entire map. And this is where we get our first issue with these sports, uh, especially in, in the other types in the, the, that aren't sports simulators. Because you can't see the whole map, anything that you show to the audience either has to be hidden from the players uh, or it has to be exactly what the player is seeing. In which case, uh, these people are moving so quickly, you actually get yourself um, motion sickness. And I've seen a lot of people get motion sickness when they're just watching what one other person is doing because of the speed that it's moving. What you can do though, is you can have uh, what's called like a, a ghost player or a spectator, which is a, someone who's got the same controls as a player, uh, but isn't actually in the game. So they're, they're a, effectively a, a ghost and what we do is we use them as cameramen so the cameraman can actually move around as if he were in a normal game but because they're they're a phantom you can run straight through them so they can be anywhere and show, show you any uh, view that you want next up uh, is the is the big one this is the the real-time strategy strategy or your top downs uh, you'll see here that you know i this person over here is controlling this number of uh, monsters and then over here there's a bunch of, there's another team that's coming up to attack them uh, what you also see though is in the background you can see there's these darker areas those are areas that you as the player can't see uh, now obviously every player and there's usually 5v5 so you've got 10 players will have their own view some might have a shared team view but you've got a minimum of two views here um, and then of course the audience wants to see everything that's going on the map because there are other things that the game spawns that's not related to the player so um, you know background players, power-ups, that kind of thing, that are hidden by the map from the players, but the audience want to see where they are. Now we're getting into the real problems here. Uh, first of all, you've got you know, huge, money, uh, huge money on the line because you've got millions of dollars here. You've got audiences who know the game back to front and have favorite teams. So they'll be standing in the audience and yelling out saying, look behind you or go left or go right. So you need to make sure that that doesn't happen. Uh, you've got the chance of a player turning around and looking at the big screen behind him and knowing everything about the game instantly. So those things are, have all got to be taken into consideration when you set up your event. Uh, these, these are really the, the, the beginning, the, the longest part of esports as well. The, the first esports really were coming around in the, the late 1990s uh, with your Starcrafts and the expansion packs there where uh, Blizzard was running ex uh, competitions to see who could win that. And majority of that was happening in Korea and South Korea to date is still the biggest market for esports, uh, closely followed by well, fighting with China. And I can tell you, whenever China beats South Korea in an esports competition, the whole country goes mad. It's, uh, it's an amazing thing to watch. Uh, the last one is a battle royale. And you can see this has kind of got a similar thing to the first person shooter, except you're standing a little bit behind the player, but that's 
that's none no, doesn't really matter so much but usually you'll see that you know you've got some other things going on here you've got lots of things happening this guy's built a lot of this uh these stairs and such so you can hide yourself there's a player over there um, you've got drop-ins that happen all throughout the game very frenetic paced uh they've usually got some kind of thing to speed up the game so uh, pubg for example shrinks the map on you so that eventually everyone gets forced into a smaller area or you've got this uh, like Fortnite where you're actually running around and building things uh, to make the map a bit more challenging. Um, they are, however, very fad based. And what can happen very quickly is you can go from being on top to on bottom uh, almost overnight. And uh, I use the example of PUBG and Fortnite here. Uh, PUBG was running with 3 million players a day uh, at the end of 2017. And then by the end of 2018, it was down to a million players a day. Uh, because those 2 million had shifted across to Fortnite. And a similar thing now is happening with Apex Legends, but I don't think it's gone as far as that. Um, the other big thing is because this is usually aimed at a younger market, these are free-to-play games on mobile. Uh, the majority of the players are coming in with mobile experience. And uh, you can imagine saying to a professional soccer team, you have to now use an oval-shaped, say, gridiron ball. They're going to say, hey, hang on, that's not the equipment we use. You know, you have to play to these players' equipment. So you have to be ready for mobile. If you're not ready for mobile, then you can basically count yourself out of esports. So how do these guys make money? And I think this is this is probably the, the big thing we have to follow here. Uh, I always tell my tech teams, you know, you've got to build the system based on who's actually paying for it. And these days, it's all about streaming. You know, it's the modern broadcasting, and that's even more evident this year. It was definitely true in December 2019, and it's going to definitely be even more true in December 2020. So this is a this is a large event. This is the LPL Finals. That's the uh, League of Legends Professional League, <laughs> um, because League of Legends is the game. Uh, this was in China, and you can see here this is a, a packed out audience of somewhere in the order of 60 to, to 70 thousand people, and the tech set up. If those of you who are watching, you can see that that whole area there is the front of house. So it's not a small operation at all. Uh, the teams here are actually hidden in these boxes. So there's one box here and another box here. That's so that they can't see the screens. Uh, it's also acoustically shielded to a degree from the PA. And it's a bit hard to tell from this, but the PA is actually in front of these guys here. And that's to get over those uh, things that we mentioned before, and I'll go into detail a bit more about what the players can see and hear, um, and also what audience members can see to the audience. It's also a bit hard to see here, but the players are actually facing away from the clear closest audience, so they couldn't get any visual cues, like someone shining a, a laser to torch in their in their face to to give them an idea. So. Why did I show those two images? Why did I say streaming and then show you a live event, a massive live event? Well, because that live event, even though it had uh, tens of thousands of people in the event, uh, in the in the arena, had millions of people watching at home. And some of these events, the, the world final that followed that event that I just showed there, had uh, a bigger audience than the Super Bowl of 2019, uh, sorry, of 2018. So we're not talking small audiences, we're talking massive audiences. And you as the technical director or as the, the person designing this have to be ready for both of those. You have to be ready for the live audience and give them the best experience. So they tell their friends that they have to come back so that they go to the regional games so that they build uh, an affinity to a team because they saw their team, but you also have to make a great broadcast experience. And if anyone's done one of those events where you're trying to balance live and broadcast, you'll know that it's not easy. Um, things that you have to think about the live audience needs to be able to hear and especially in an event like that you want to have big big speakers you want to hear everything you want to have that that reverb effect you want to feel the the, the shots you know thumping it's the same as going to a a big rock concert you want to feel that kick drum thumping through your body but at the same time the broadcast audience need to hear everything that's going on uh, i mentioned shoutcasters and i'll come back to those you know we, they need to be audible you know, the broadcast team also wants to be able to see the players. Uh, anyone who's tried to, be, tried to be a cameraman at a live event will know it's almost impossible to get a good shot, a good, even a good photo of someone performing on stage because stage lighting is not camera lighting. It's designed to look good for the audience. It's got lots of colour. It's got lots of depth to it. Um, but cameras just can't handle that. They can't handle the change in colour temperatures as well. And the players want to interact with the live audience. You know, you see them, it's like any performer, any performer gets energized by going on stage and having people interact with them. But that's exactly what we don't want to have. You know, it's very 
fine for everyone to be standing at a, at a cricket match. And when someone hits the ball, they all stand up and scream, you know, because they, they've hit a boundary. Uh, but you can't do that at a, at a esports game because there's a possibility that you're actually going to give something away. If someone makes a good move on one side of the map and everyone cheers, then you want to make sure that the other guys don't think, ah, they've probably got that thing. You know, it's a dead giveaway. So let's have a quick look at streaming sites. You know, this is a screenshot I took the other day. I just went straight to Twitch, which is the biggest streaming site now, uh, but there are a few others, especially in China. And I mean, straight away, you can see here's all the, the signs here. So this wasn't logged in, this was on my work computer. I've never looked at Twitch on this before, but straight away, we've got esports at the top here. Uh, almost everything down here is some kind of game. And you can see some of the men things I mentioned before. You've got Apex Legends. You've got, you know, Fortnite three times. Um, you've got some of the other first person games like uh, Call of Duty and God of War. And then over here, you know, of course, there's a, funnily enough, there was a chess game first up, but it is someone streaming. And this person's got six people viewing him right at that second. Uh, down the bottom, you've actually got League of Legends. You've got, uh, I believe that's, uh, no, it's not Counter-Strike, but it's one of those other first person games. And then you've got God of War. So t streaming now has been completely taken over by gaming, either competitive esports uh, or by people who were just esports players who were just streaming in their, in their, let's call it their downtime. And now why would they do that? Well, first of all, the, the, sorry, the, the highlights there to say exactly what I said, you know, this is, this is <laughs> what people do, but the money that comes from streaming is actually about a third of the overall revenue that goes to esports. Now there's two, two ways to do that. The first one is through advertising on a stream. So if I, if I have one of these streams here and someone comes to view me, then I will get some advertising money every time someone sees an ad or clicks an ad. But at the same time, I can also subscribe to, to Voiboy up here and I can start, start a subscription. I can pay him every month or I can pay him during the stream if he does something good. And those two things combined make up a third uh, of, of the revenue, which is more than uh, the media advertising that you'd get on a broadcast channel or the broadcast rights um, or sponsorship. So when we think about a normal sports team, we're usually talking about sponsorship and broadcast rights. If you talk about a Formula One team, that's where they get their money. Uh, a football team, that's where they get their money. An NFL team, it's sports right, it's uh, broadcasting rights and sponsorship. But with streaming now, people have gotten so much money from this, they're able to do things like this. Um, if you look up streaming houses or look up uh, 100 Thieves, 100T um, on, on YouTube, you'll get this video here. And this is what they call a house. So they literally go out and buy a house and they'll have their team uh, with a, a practice room here and that is streamed 24 seven. So anything these guys do is streamed and they're making money off that all the time. Um, some facilities like uh, some of the ones in Shanghai are built by the leagues. Others are built by the teams after they win um, the, this money because effectively you've got a bunch of 20 year olds with a lot of money. They can do this to make even more money. So they'll love it. Excuse me. But then on the other side, we have the live event side of it. So um, if, if we have a look at the, the ESL, this is one of the ESL finals for Counter-Strike Go. Uh, you can see every player has got some, um, a camera pointed at their face, the play, uh, the, the video switches can take any one of these views plus any of their cameraman views and put that onto the screen. And you can just get a sense of the audience in the back there. That's another arena show with tens of thousands of people. Um, China is probably the best example of this. So LPL over there have built six facilities uh, of varying sizes. Some of them two or 300 people. The biggest one I think is about 500 people, uh, but they also have six fly pack sets. Uh, because what they're trying to do is have that home game away game feel. And this has really helped them in the last couple of months because they can send that fly pack to any small room, uh, plug it in, and it's all connected via remote connection back to their facility in Shanghai. So the engineers can stay in Shanghai. They don't have to travel uh, and they can be controlling any of the events anywhere else just using the LPL network. And that then gets you this local live um, event feeling so that if you like, uh, you know, 100 Thieves, for example, from the last slide, you can go and see them without having to travel too far. Uh, every, basically every night, six nights a week, there's events and these things are like cycling through. So they'll do two or three games in a night and you can have a ticket to see all three or you can come in and out uh, for, for just one of them. And it, it is... Uh, supercharged sports event in a tiny little room and it's it's great it's really it's really an experience that you'd have to go and see 
So the live event is part of it as well. Live events also make up uh, about 10% of the overall revenue as well um, for the teams. But of course, once you build that team loyalty, you then get them on your streaming audience. So they're building more money there. Cool. So how do we bring all this together? Here's the, uh, here's the event. So basically, let me bring all this up here. We have um, team A and team B. They're obviously the biggest, uh, biggest part of the, the event, but we need to have a stage. You know, we know that you can't just have a bunch of people hanging around. Uh, you need to have them on something. Then, of course, we have their backstage. They have their coaches. They have their friends. They have their backup players. They have their warm-up areas. That's all backstage, and so we need to have those back there. We also have judges. Uh, one thing I haven't mentioned is that uh, a lot of esports this day, these days are focused, um, critically focused on um, legitimacy. They have mentioned it a few times. We don't want to have people calling out from the audience and saying, hey, he's behind you. We don't want to have um, someone somehow impacting how those two teams are going to play the game. So the judges are watching that uh, mm -hmm. and they will be absolutely on point when it comes to legitimacy of the game. And then, of course, we have an audience. So the audience is there. They need to see, they need to hear. So we have screens, we have speakers, we have LED walls, and then we have lighting so they can actually see the teams. Um, you saw before that a lot of these guys are in the boxes. Uh, if they're in a box, it's very hard to see that, but of course we need to make it a bit interesting. So that's why we also have cameras so they can see what's going on there. At the front of house area, you'll have uh, an announcer, um, usually more than one, it's a sports event. And what you'll see is that the announcers are usually called shoutcasters because they will stand up and they will shout. So again, you've got these speakers, these massive PA speakers, blasting out everything that's happening in the game that the announcer is seeing. But of course, we don't want the teams to be able to hear that. So that's a, that's a typical audio setup that was, uh, that was in prep for, I believe it was the, the photo we saw before, the LBL finals. Um, and you'll see that there's multiple consoles and it's a bit harder to see, but in the racks of gear, you've got lots of um, intercom matrices. There's an intercom matrix over there. There's a third console over there. These are actually mixing uh, for the teams themselves. And there's a lot of mixing that actually also goes on within matrices and intercom systems. So let's have a quick look at the audio challenges because these are generic to everything. You know, you have to mix in the player intercom, so they're them talking to each other. You need to have the game audio, plus you need to have the judges and the coaches for each player. You know, so the judge needs to be able to jump in and say, hey, sorry, you know, that's not allowed, or you know, put your hands off the keyboard, you're dead now, whatever it is. Uh, and the coaches need to be able to jump into each player and say, okay, I think you should go left, or let's all go together as a team, or let's split up. You know, the live audience is able to see the screen. They can see everything that's going on, and they can, if they want to, yell out to the players on stage. And you've got the announcer who, even if the audience doesn't want to get on it, the audience, the announcer has to explain everything to the audience. Lastly, you've got this kind of um, mix of reality and game-based footage. So now we're talking about uh, the stream itself. So if we're looking at the stream audio, you need to know where your audio is coming from because as these people move around, the people listening also want to hear what the player is listening. Uh, sound is a very, very important part of the first person games um, and the, the, the Battle Royale games, because if someone's coming up behind you, you want to be able to hear that. And of course, if you're trying to learn how to be the best player, you need that as well. So we need to know whose audio we're listening to. Are we listening to the virtual cameraman or are we listening to the player? And then we also need to know where that positioning is. Uh, a lot of systems these days will have some kind of positioning data in there as well, like HRTF is the main one. Uh, an example to use the, the JBL system is our new quantum headphones actually have that as you move your head around, they'll try and track the audio with you. So that all needs to be fed to the broadcast team, to the streaming team to make sure that gets out. So let's have a look at some of the, the audio flows here. Uh, so you have the game audio, which has to go to the player. And usually they'll just have a pair of earbuds that'll go directly to their computer, directly to their ears, because they don't want to have uh, any delay. And if you look at photos of esports players, you'll often see that they'll have a pair of cans on like this, but then they'll also have a second set of wires going in there. And that's for their IEMs, their in-ear monitors. Next, you have comms. And you can do comms directly through the game audio, but if you want the judges to, to monitor that, which may or may not be required, you probably need to have a separate headset and a separate system for that. So now we've suddenly got two systems. We have the game audio and the comms. And then we have the shoutcasters yelling out to the audience. And that's where I like to have this red line here. We have what the players can hear and what they absolutely shouldn't hear. First of all, they shouldn't hear the audience. Secondly, they shouldn't hear the shoutcasters. 
you've got the main PA, which is may not, is, have a mix of both the shoutcasters and the other team's audio. If they are, if the main screen is following the other team, you can hear their audio and that may give away cues. Then down over here, we have the stream audience. So the stream audience, of course, want to have everything. They want to have all the team comms. They want to have the game audio. They want to hear what the judges are saying sometimes. They also want to have that feeling that they're in the event. So they want to hear the live audience as well. And so that broadcast audio mixer is going to take everything from everywhere and then mix it down for the stream audience. And that's where we need a matrix. So a matrix, big, usually a big square like this, it's got lots of inputs and lots of outputs. Now, normally you'd think about a big audio mixer, but of course we don't have space for a big audio mixer in a lot of these events. So how can we get around that? Well, I see that there's, there's two ways, basically. You've got a traditional mixer or you've got a network mixer. Either of those is going to work, but they've got these common features. So any input can go to any output without blocking any of the others. Uh, inputs can be split and easily sent to multiple outputs. And you would like to also be able to mix in there as well to a certain degree. You don't want to have to be sending a whole bunch of streams out and then have someone complain about the levels. You want to be able to edit those levels. So the game audio uh, is always less than the judge's audio, for example. Uh, and that also makes the live, uh, the live audio guy or the broadcast audio guy's job a lot easier. So let's have, oh, sorry, let's have a quick look at a traditional mixer. So as uh, a matrix, these are usually a big box device. Um, you know, you'd send a lot of things into it. Some of them are connected via some kind of proprietary standard. So if we look at BSS London, we're talking Blue Link. If we're talking Stage Tech Nexus, it's their own IP based uh, fiber network. Um, these are, you'd see one of these, I'd say, at pretty much every esports event of size. Uh, I say read artist, that could easily be uh, an RTS or a Clearcom Intercom Matrix, but uh, artist seems to be one of the most favoured. And then when we talk about big audio distribution systems, uh, Nexus is one of the more populars. Uh, London will show up as well. London is our version where you have a whole bunch of inputs and outputs. The other way, though, is a, is a network system. And uh, this, this is one of those areas where people you need to sort of start combining two or three things together. And one of them would be uh, an audio over IP standard, like a Dante or an AF67. Um, and in the past, people would see that just as a transport method to get from one input to your mixer, to your matrix, and then from your matrix out to your output. So you could still bring signals in from a lot of different places, from a lot of faraway places into your central matrix. But if you do it right, you can actually completely get rid of the matrix. You don't need the core anymore because you can still have that functionality of any input to any output, uh, splitting inputs to multiple outputs or mixing within a, map, uh, within a network itself. And another thing that's really great about these is that a network matrix isn't limited in size. If I were to buy a frame of anything, it doesn't matter if it's London or if it's Nexus uh, or RTS, that frame is going to have a limited size. It'll be a 300 by 300 or a 500 by 500 or a 32 by 32. Once I go over that, I have to buy a new device. With a network, I'm only really limited by the amount of bandwidth on, on my switches. And because my switches these days are in the sort of gigabit range, 10 gigabit, 100 gigabit, uh, audio signals being only six megabit, uh, are never, never gonna get anywhere near that kind of limit. So we've done, uh, well, I've seen networks, not particularly in, in broadcast, uh, in, sorry, in um, uh, esports, but in broadcast facilities where they're planning to have 20,000 signals uh, and they're, they're fine with that. And to think about a, a, what you'd need to get a, an audio matrix, a core audio matrix of 20,000 square, you'd be talking about a, a, an entire facility just full <laughs> of, of hardware. So how do we do this? You know, basically, you've got your traditional signals, these microphones. Now, those microphones may actually have um, network capabilities, so they'll be able to go directly to a switch. Uh, but if they don't, you can use an audio converter. And I've just, you know, trying to be brand friendly here. I've showed a, a London Blue, but there are, of course, are, are heaps of uh, analog or digital to Dante or AS67 converters. Uh, my stream mixer and my front of house mixer now can just plug into that with one cable effectively and pull as many signals off that network as they want. Uh, now, the switch here I've shown is, is copper, but you'd probably be using fiber at that level. And I would always suggest, as a side note, always use single mode fiber for everything. Multi-mode fiber should be dead. Uh, we have audio processors, so if we need to do some delays, if we need to do some EQs or anything else, they can just be connected into the network and they can be anywhere. 
And that's a great thing when you think about these events, uh, especially smaller events that need to move very quickly. You want to have a rack, you want to plug it in. And if it's noisy, maybe you want to stick it out the back and just run one network cable out to it. So you can keep your, your processes out of the noise area. You can keep lower that noise floor in the, in the whole space. And also you can make them a bit secure. Again, going back to legitimacy. Excuse me. Um, and then you've got your amplifiers. And most amplifiers these days have actually got um, some kind of uh, network input. So either direct in network input or via some kind of adapter card or adapter. And that will then go out to your front of house speakers. Similarly, we can go straight to our stream output. If we're staying within um, in the, the network realm, I can go directly off my mixer or I can also take that directly off my, uh, my switch. So that was a quick rundown of the audio systems and what you basically need and then a couple of solutions there. And like I said, towards the end, I'll come back to like a, a happy meal that gives you a bit of a scope of this. Uh, but the lighting systems, I just wanted to briefly touch on because I mentioned before, you need basically four types of lighting. You need the broadcast lighting. You need to make sure that the players are bright enough and let's, <laughs> let, me, let me put this in context. I'm talking about the color of the light here. They need to be in a white enough light um, to, to be seen by the camera in a way that doesn't make them look strange. Uh, if you have too many colored lights on a, on a player, it can look very weird. Even when you do color effects, there's usually some white front lights, some key lighting to keep them there. Uh, but at the same time, you want to make sure that the front of house lighting is there so the audience can see the players in a way that's interesting. Um, flat white light is very boring to look at and can, you know, it can also bug the players. So you need to have that balance between those two areas. Uh, you need to have effects lighting, uh, which is something that will actually make something look interesting. And then lastly, you need to have LED walls, which aren't necessarily your video walls, uh, but they're things that will actually bring up effects. Um, and unfortunately, I don't have a photo of this, but a great example is in Japan. Uh, there is a facility here called LFS, looking for squad. And all of the lights around uh, the, the boxes where the players are kept um, are, are basically set up so that they will show the team colors or whatever's happening in the game. So if a, if a bomb is being planted, everything goes orange and starts flashing and increases the panic in the room. Um, so in general, what you end up having is you have, you have your stage lights, your effects lights here, which are basically the, the lights that wave around and, and off you go uh, to, to keep the audience interested. And then you'll have your broadcast lights, which are usually in tight um, so that they're just kind of pinning onto where the cameras need to look. So on cam uh, players' faces, sponsor banners, that kind of thing. Um, the other, whereas the lights for the front of house are usually a bit placed a bit further back to give you a wider wash, to give you more variation and a bit more of a, a softer light there. If we look at... Um, Something that's happened here. Now, this obviously is an esports. This is a photo I had myself from the uh, Commonwealth Games in Australia in 2018. Uh, you can see in the background there's lots of sort of purples and blues and lots of event lights up here, but the players are all hit with a very strong white light, and that's so that the cameras can pick up their faces uh, without being distorted. Um, for that, you need what's called a, a good uh, CRI, a color res rendition index, because if you have tens of thousands of lights in a massive event, you want to make sure that as the camera pans from one person to the next, you're not having someone who's blue because that person's got a, that, that light has got a lot higher color temperature. And then someone who looks orange because that light's got a lower color temperature. Uh, that's also very important when we talk about sponsorship because brands are very, very sensitive about the, the colors there. When we talk about effects lighting, this is again from the, uh, from the opening ceremony, just because I had the photos, so it was easy to get. These are effects lights. So we have, you know, the audience being turned purple. We've got some um, yellow lights shown into the sky here. Uh, that's a completely different kind of fixture that you want. You usually want your moving heads for this. Um, LED is the, the main thing here now. Um, and most LEDs now have got these kind of cool features where you can, you can show different colors in different parts of the light. So even if they're facing the audience, you can still make it interesting for the audience. And then lastly, these are, these are kind of some LED walls that we have, you know, the LED effects lights. And that's what I was talking about before with uh, the looking for squad. These things can be different colors and show different patterns depending on what's going on during the game. Um, you can also have it maybe as like a, a, a rough counter. So the more players that, are, that have been killed, the more things that get stacked up and it builds the tension. So quickly into the into the video system, which is probably the hardest part um, technically, but it's is kind of relatively simple to show. So you have um, you have your main screen that you place the the audience need to see, and you only have a very limited number of real cameras. 
usually you'll have one per player or even just one per team just to show their faces and their reactions. Uh, and then you have one for the shoutcaster so that you can show that them on stage, you know, especially during, uh, during breaks. You'll usually also have, especially in, in smaller events, you'll have a spectator PC that's providing the main video feed. And that's so that you don't have to worry about taking video splits off the individual computers or mobiles, uh, and that you don't have any players complaining that you're impacting their gameplay by increasing their latency by having to, to, to deal with their system. Um, so to, to get rid of those, those problems, we usually use a spectator PC. So all of those go into a video mixer, and then the outputs for that are the main screen and a streaming coder. Now, this is where we start thinking about what's the right tool for the job, because I can go into any broadcast truck these days, and I'll find something like this. Uh, so this is a Sony MVS 8K. Um, these, these are the, the top of the line 4K mixer. They've got IP, they've got a, a SDI, they've got everything you can imagine, uh, but they do cost between quarter of a million and a, and a million bucks. Uh, the original eSports events were usually done on something like this because they were mostly run by, say, an NEP company, a big outside broadcast company. And that's what they had, because that's what you need uh, for a football game, where you've got 60 cameras. Uh, an example is, is the Formula One, where there's 64 cameras or more. Uh, plus, then you've got all the data and streams coming from the cars and the on-car videos and such. So you need a massive, massive switcher. But because, as we saw before, there's not many cameras, uh, you can limit the video sources by using something like a spectator rather than taking the game view. You can actually get away with a much, much, much smaller console. And I've, I've thrown in the, the Ross Graphite here because this is a, a fairly common um, uh, console that you'll see at the sort of mid-sized esports uh, arenas. So a Ross Graphite is going to cost you, give or take, 40K, which is probably more than you'd have in your pocket, but it's also within reasonable uh, grasping distance of a, of a rental company. So you'll find that if you want to rent one of these, you're usually renting an entire OB truck at the cost of, you know, $100,000, $150,000 per day, uh, plus services, or you can go to your rental company and there's a good chance that they'll have something like a Ross Graphite. At the other end, at the sort of starting out level, the vMix and OBS are two of the most popular bits of software out there for streaming. So OBS, uh, especially because it will connect directly to um, Twitch or other streaming platforms, and vMix does that now as well. Uh, but OBS and vMix you can download for free. You can download it and you can be streaming usually within about half an hour. Uh, vMix has got more event-related um, functions, and that's why you can see it sort of ranges from free up to about $1,200. But even then at $1,200, you've got the fully featured 4K vMix uh, platform, which will then use your computer as the video mixer uh, and will accept a number of streams in as well as streams coming off other computers and from uh, from spectator computers. So those two there are really great options to, to start yourself off, especially in the video area. So conscious of time, I know I've blasted through a lot of things there and I'm hoping that you've got some questions. Um, I just want to show you basically what I what I call like the right size for an event. Now, if we're looking at like the, the absolute bare essential, you know, if we're looking at a, a high school or a university level event, and I need to just quickly mention the importance of these events. Um, in Japan, for example, uh, the, the eSports union, Jesu, is putting, is putting a lot of effort into high school events. And the reason for that is to try and normalize people th um, thinking about eSports as a sport on the same level as any other sport. Because in, as I mentioned before, it is, you know, it has people who practice and only do that. It has um, a worldwide following and everyone does it, you know, so it's, it, it, you know, people want to watch the best players there. So by showing it at a high school level, you then kind of normalize it. People think, oh, this is just the same as joining a baseball club. I can join the baseball club or the CSGO club. Now, player intercom, um, this is something that's, that is critical. As I mentioned, you need to be able to talk to the other players and you need to be able to control what they're hearing. But there are systems like Discord, again, a free bit of software that you can use. Uh, or some games even have their own built-in communication system. And you just use that and some standard gaming headsets. That will let you have your teams talking to each other, their coach maybe jumping in and talking to them as well. Uh, but it won't let you have that uh, judge break in. The judges won't be able to hear everything that's going on. Uh, but if you're not talking about a top level competition, then that's more than enough, I think. Uh, for the stream production, a lot of uh, games will either have what they call like a tournament mode or a spectator mode. 
which will allow someone to switch between players, find the most interesting view or be a spectator themselves. So one, it's like a one man operation and you see all of that. Now that same computer, if it's powerful enough, could be running OBS or vMix free, again, a free bit of software. Uh, and then you'd just be pumping that straight out, uh, both probably to the screen and to the stream. And that there has got you covered. You could, if you wanted to split out, um, split out uh, the live video production onto a separate computer and have somebody else operate that separate to uh, the stream. And again, you'd, that's where you do something like vMix free. Uh, vMix is a lot easier to use as a mixer rather than OBS, which is more about scenes and like a production. Uh, so I wouldn't suggest you'd use OBS there. And then of course you need your standard thing like a projector or a large screen. In these events, usually to, to keep the players separate and to keep them separate from the audience, the best thing to do is either put them in separate rooms or put them in what I call like a fish tank where you've got like a glass surround or a, one of those Perspex drum surrounds so that they can't get as much noise. But again, the stakes aren't so high, so you don't have to be so, um, so onto that. Lighting, you'd probably just use white light. You know, we're talking about small events. You might have some effects lights if you've got them, um, but nothing too fancy. And then same with the sound, you know, portable powered speakers. You chuck up a couple of, say, Eon speakers onto some sticks and a little console and you're fine. Uh, the one thing I did say though here is um, digital is preferred and d digital is preferred because you want to be able to recall scenes very quickly. Um, small format mixes that are digital will usually let you handle more channels. Um, than a, than a larger format analog console in a smaller footprint. So stepping it up now, we're talking about, you know, a, like a high school final or a university level heat, you know, where we've, we've now got some money. We're talking about some collegiate level games. Um, you might still want to be sticking to the, to the, um, to the in-game comms or something like discord, but there are also a number of, um, hardware intercom systems that are built for games. Uh, the Astro gaming mixer is one of the most popular ones. Um, and that will have the ability to have not just your own comms, you have uh, your game audio in there, you can have other people's game audio, and you can then also have judge channels and such going on there. So that's a good little tip to have. Uh, and it will also let the player very easily mix between the comms level and the game level. So if they're trying to concentrate on the game, they can turn the game up and completely ignore the comms and their teammates yelling into them. In the stream production, again, you probably use the same stuff here. Now, you might want to upgrade your vMix, but OBS uh, or vMix are absolutely capable of doing uh, a, let's call it a good enough stream with insets. They can both do picture in picture. They can show you the game video or the spectator video uh, and a couple of other sources uh, without having to go too far overboard. And again, same with the, the, project, the projector. A large screen, one single large screen is going to be enough. Um, however, you're probably at this point going to want to start throwing in some effects lights. You know, you're going to want to actually have some color, some movement. Um, once you're talking about final level events or like a proper collegiate event, um, you're going to have half times. You're going to have changeovers between games. You're going to want to sort of engage the audience a bit more. And so that's where effects lighting can really help that out. Uh, but again, on the sound side, even at a larger event, I would suggest keeping the, the front of house PA as low as you can. Um, because then you're going to get less bleed coming back on stage. You know, none of us have the time to set up a massive line array and do the calculations and make sure that there's no spill back onto stage. So you want to be able to say, I'm just going to put a speaker up, push it forward, uh, turn the volume down and we're gone. Uh, that of course changes now when we move to, let's say, uh, uh, what I would call a large event and large in esports is usually above 300 people as an audience uh, because most of them are contained in smaller, smaller areas. Uh, at this point, this is where you really want to get into a matrix intercom. Um, so the matrix I mentioned before is about getting those inputs and outputs and letting anyone listen to anything or conversely having someone controlling who hears what. Now with a matrix intercom, you can take all of the game audio sources, you can take all of the player intercom, all of the judges and everything else, uh, and then mix it out so that each player gets their own individual mix, uh, which would then be completely, let's call it legal within the game rules um, that they have, that they've set, uh, but you would then have to have an engineer running that. In the stream production, you definitely want to start paying for the tournament mode uh, if, it, if it is available. If not, you'd probably want to have three or four additional players who are also very good at the game who can jump in there and become your software, uh, sorry, your, your, your spectators, your cameramen. Um, this is where you'd probably want to either go for either a, like a, the top level of the vMix um, area. And the reason you want to do that is because you want to be able to throw in graphics and recording. Um, the smaller levels of vMix don't let you do graphics overlays, but you want to have those wipes. You want to have sponsors. You want to have uh, the ability to roll an ad. That will come in at the, uh, the top end of vMix. 
Or alternatively, you could go for something like a graphite. You know, even at this level, I'd say you don't need to be thinking about your, your 4K Sony can, um, <laughs> uh, switches. A graphite is going to have more than enough power to get you through one of those events. And in fact, I would think even, even the, the top end events, it's only when you've got like an arena event with tens of thousands of people that you'd be thinking about touching one of those um, top end video uh, production systems. Uh, again, you want to have probably a, a real mixer now. The reason that I say real mixer, I'm talking about a tactile interface. Uh, vMix at the top end will allow you to have tactile interfaces, but when you think about something like a graphite like a, or, or any other, um, you know, a Panasonic uh, video switcher, you've now got the controls that a video engineer is used to. And that's probably the key difference when you move up to a large event. You want to have professionals running this and professionals want to have equipment that they're used to. So you want to have T-bars, you want to have, um, you know, multiple mix engines. So having a, a real thing here, especially for the live part where you might have to switch quickly away from one screen if, if there's something going on that's, uh, that you don't want the audience to see, um, you want to have the guy to be able to be, feel comfortable using that. Uh, at the lower levels, I've said you basically just want to use the standard venue lighting for your white light, but definitely when you get to a bigger event here, when you're going to have a streaming audience in the, the tens of thousands or, or, or higher, uh, you want to make sure that the lighting is done properly because that stream, as I mentioned before, is where the money's coming from in a lot of these events. So you need to make sure that it looks good. If your stream looks crap and everyone else's looks good, uh, they're going to switch to somebody else's stream. But you now need to go really high end with the effects lights. That live audience is now critical. There's a few hundred of them. They need to build up the tension so that you actually build up the tension with the teams as well to make it a real event. Um, that's where you need to actually put some time and effort into making sure those effects lights are, are, are on point. Um, one thing I've mentioned here though is that the sound, even though the sound is very complex, if you have a big matrix, especially an intercom matrix at the top, you can then basically stem mix off the matrix intercom and then feed that to your front of house mixer. So your front of house mixer might have team A and team B intercom mix. It'll have your um, stream uh, shoutcasters. And then you might have uh, some, some audio, like game audio, which will probably be provided by the judges. Uh, or again, could even be coming from the, the matrix intercom. Uh, that way you don't need to have a massive, massive front of house console. And if you remember a few slides ago, even though we were talking about a, uh, an arena size event, the console that they were using was relatively small. I think it was a, a Digico. Uh, and then of course though, you want to have a concert PA system that's fit for the room. You don't want to have uh, stand up speakers on sticks. That's just not going to work for you. Um, you need to now be really planning who's going to hear what, which direction are the speakers going, are my subs cardioid, are they not? You need to have, again, professionals dealing with this uh, because at this level, the stakes do become a bit higher. This is where your scouts come in. This is where they find new talent. This is where people are picked for new teams. Uh, and if your setup is such that they there's uh, even the perception that there might be able to be cheating going on, um, then basically you've, we've written all those players out of any kind of scouting or, or professional opportunities. So you want to make sure that that's there. Okay, so I've blasted through those last things in the bottom. I just want to shout out uh, quickly that a, a lot of the photos that I received there were courtesy of TechSound, um, which are my good friends in Shanghai who taught me a lot about this. Um, and because I was using their photos and we've got copyright written on the bottom, I wanted to make sure that they got their dues there. So they have given me permission to use those photos. Um, you've got my email address there. I'm more than happy for anyone to reach out to me after the session or if you're watching this on the, on the recording to, to ping me with any questions. Uh, otherwise, uh, that's it from me. But uh, hopefully you guys guys in the live stream have got some questions for me. Laura, so I'll hand it back to you. Thanks, Cameron. Um, it's a quiet group. <laughs> we haven't had anything come in. Um, so like Cameron said, if you have anything that you want to send to him directly, his contact information is up on the screen and he'd be happy to answer your questions. Um, this recording will be put up in a few days. So if you have anything that you wanted to look back on, um, or if you wanted to catch his first session that he did in the beginning of our learning sessions, that is out on our playlist as well. Um, and we have a full calendar of upcoming sessions. If you want to go out to pro.harman.com, you can check out what's coming up for the remainder of July and for August. But thank you so much, Cameron, really appreciate it. Um, and we're getting some thanks in from the Q&A box. So thank you everyone for attending. We certainly do appreciate your time. Thanks, Cameron, yes. have a great night. You guys too, and uh, thanks everyone for attending.